Good evening, and welcome to Baltimore County Dialogues on Race. After exploring education, voting rights, police reform, health equity, and education, tonight, in culmination of Pride Month, we turn our attention to supporting the LGBTQIA plus community. In July of 2009, the Senate approved the Matthew Shepard Act, which outlaws hate crimes based on both sexual orientation and gender identity. In June of 2015, the Supreme Court ruled that all same-sex marriages must be recognized nationwide. In July of 2020, the Supreme Court ruled that LGBTQIA plus workers cannot be fired for their sexual orientation or gender identity. Despite these milestones, according to data from dosomething.org, 42% of people who are LGBTQIA plus reported living in an unwelcome environment. Legislative actions and policies negatively impacting their civil rights continue to exist and phobia and violence against this community is on the rise. Data by the National Crime Victimization Survey evidences that LGBTQIA plus people are four times more likely than non-LGBTQIA plus people to experience violent victimization. How can we address the disparities between LGBTQIA and non-people in the realms of health, employment, the justice system, law enforcement interactions, education, housing, and immigration to improve lives for all, particularly for LGBTQIA plus people of color, living at the intersection of identities, suffering from multiple forms of discrimination. This is the subject of tonight's discussion, but first allow me to introduce our moderator, Faraji Muhammad. Faraji Muhammad is a media personality with the special skills of community organizing and non-professional management from Baltimore, Maryland. In 1999, Faraji co-founded NLLC, New Leadership Learning Center Incorporated at the age of 19 years old. Faraji has 20 years of experience working with young people and has centered his many missions and initiatives around one simple concept, redefining leadership for the next generation and especially the black community. Throughout Baltimore, Faraji is known as humble in spirit and high in energy. He has used his passion for young people as to be an advocate for their concerns and an example, community servant. Starting in 2005, Faraji made his broadcasting um, 15 years ago as he has served as creator and host of Listen Up that's that year from 2005 to 2017 on WEEA 88.9 FM. From 2015 to 2016, Faraji was invited to the Radio One family by Miss Kathy Hughes herself to serve as a co-host for the Larry King, the Larry Young Morning Show on Praise 106.1 FM and WOLB 1010 AM in Baltimore. With that platform, Faraji used his brands of blending political and social justice knowledge with satirical humor and cultural insight to become a needed voice about issues for next generation leadership, police brutality, politics, and education. He has been on CNN, Matter of Fact, and other news outlets. He formerly served on TV One's News One Now with Roland Martin and NPR's All Things Considered as a contributor. Faraji is the former host of the Associated Press award-winning daily news and cultural show For the Culture that aired on Public Radio 88.9 WEAA-FM, Morgan State University. Faraji will continue to use his activism to highlight topical issues from politics and education to health and black arts and culture. Welcome Faraji Muhammad.
Uh, um, you just there we go. Great. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, I truly appreciate the uh, the the warm warm um, introduction, and most importantly, I appreciate the Baltimore County Public Library and the Baltimore County um, Office of Human Relations for continuing to have these very very important conversations about very pressing issues in a way that is very, I would like to say, unfiltered. Um, we get we 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 bring people together. We have been having a number of these conversations, and I have been very um, honored and privileged and humbled by the opportunity to moderate everything from conversations about policing and education. Uh, but tonight, this is a very special conversation in many, many different ways because we want to talk about the struggles and, and talking about the gains, but at the same time, the work that is being done within the LGBTQIA plus community uh, for equality. And I think that uh, the panelists that we have here tonight will give us some insight about what does that struggle look like and how can we, and I'm saying we of all different races and backgrounds and community, but especially those of us within the black community, how can we have conversations, different conversations about members of this community to be able to accept and to be able to support uh, the work that is going on in this community. So I'm very, very excited and I'm very humbled to be a part of uh, this discussion. Uh, I wanna take the time to just first and foremost, uh, welcome our wonderful panelists. And I appreciate each and every one of you for being with us tonight. To have this conversation, I see my dear sister, Sister Bakari, who I have a great respect for, um, privilege um, of working with, but I just I just love this sister and I love what she does. But most importantly, to get out of the meritocracy of it all, I love who she is. And so, you know, it's just a wonderful situation to see people continue to grow. But I'm open and I'm I'm willing to hear and listen, and I hope you're willing to do the same, folks, to hear what folks are going through in this community. You might be hearing tidbits of conversations and information. You might be, you might think that you know, but we really don't. And this is the important thing about having dialogue such as this one. Because if we don't start the process with communication, we won't understand the path that people are walking. We won't understand the humanity that people are looking to gain in this whole process. So I, I, I'm really just happy that we can have a, a, a discussion around this. So I would like to take the time to talk to our, just to introduce our panelists um, because they all bring something very important to this conversation. But let me just lay out the framework here. When we're talking about the concerns, the struggle, the triumphs, the gains, and then the ongoing path um, to finding equality among the LGBTQIA plus community, we're talking about that, that, that great moment in American history from Stonewall in the 1960s to even what we're seeing now with the Black Trans Lives Matter marches. And, and, and then you're talking about this community, even though we kind of quote unquote lump it all together, there is a different struggle that is happening among people of color within the LGBTQIA plus community that we may not even be aware of. And so, we want to, have to bring that to light. But we're finding that those individuals that are part of the community of people of color, they're really are the ones that are on the front lines of this social justice movement. And so unfortunately, we're finding that their needs are often overlooked. They're not being discussed properly with respect. And most importantly, they're not making the type of gains that we are all seeking, which is freedom, justice, and equality. So uh, let's start, let me introduce our wonderful panelists, starting with Kleiss Abina. Kleiss is a healer, a teacher, a writer, editor, and environmental justice advocate. And Ms. Kleiss Abina, AKA uh, Upe Sika, uh, Upe uh, CK, excuse me, I don't wanna mispronounce her name. Ms. Tree Turtle is the CEO of the Baltimore Wisdom Project, the BWP, and the co-CEO of Wisdom Projects Incorporated, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to peace education. 
She is a veteran movement organizer for radically healing trauma responses approaches to community building for mul multiple mul marginalized low-income black and brown youth and adults. Kleiss has been an ordained Buddhist and, and for 30 plus years, she, ha um, she has trained extensively in holistic health practices rooted in mindfulness at institutions such as Wat Fra, I'm hoping I'm saying that, pro uh, pronouncing that correctly, and which is, oh, I'm sorry, Wat Fra de Makaya in Thailand. She is a longtime developer of anti-violence programming and a pioneer in the creation of gender inclusive, credible messaging programs for peace. And she was one of the first holistic health practitioners and educators to introduce high quality evidence-based secular approaches to mindfulness, restorative justice and restorative practices to schools, community centers, centers and prisons in the Baltimore, Washington, DC area back in the early 1990s. So she's been doing this work for a very long time. And along with an MA in science writing and poetry from Johns Hopkins University and an F MFA in interdisciplinary arts education, she has earned a certificate in trauma-informed care in 1991, when we weren't even having a conversation about trauma-informed care. From the Armstrong School for Adult Education in Washington, DC, one of the first programs of its kind. She holds additional cert certifications in conflict transformation and several other holistic modalities. She implemented and taught healing arts programs for such groups as the S-M-Y-A-L, the Lorton Correctional Complex, the Frederick Douglass Creative Arts Center, 29th Street Community Center, the Chick Webb Center, and the McKim Center. And as a nurse, she worked on AIDS uh, wards, pediatric wards, and mental health units uh, at DC General, Maryland General, Providence Hospital, the Walter P. Carter Psychiatric Center, and the Ohio Hospital for Psychiatry. She was a certified a uh, public school science and language arts teacher in Baltimore and Columbus and a mindful movement instructor, instructor number two at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. And as the director of operations for Baltimore's Inner Harbor Project, she wrote the organization's anti-violence mediation handbook and helped train youth how to apply the work of the handbook within workshops for Baltimore City's law enforcement officers and business leaders in Baltimore's downtown district a widely published push card, which is an award-winning author and journalist. She executed anti-violence interventions and mediations internationally in West Africa and Southern China on behalf of organizations such as Genders Within and Midwest Holistic. For 35 years, she has also helped uplift the policy work, educational programming, fundraising, and strategic communications of such nonprofit organizations as the Reverend Vernon Dobson Group within Build, the Institute for Survey Research, the Crack Center, Simple Music and Dance, Many Voices, the Bethune Museum and Archives, and the Shakespeare Theater. Kleiss, we welcome you to the conversation. Thank you so much, sis. We like to now introduce our second guest, August Clayton who uses the pronoun or they, them, and he and him. He's a black trans grant writer, organizer, and nonprofit professional currently based in Atlanta, Georgia, rooted in Southern Maryland. August began organizing during their first years, first few years of undergrad around trans inclusion in higher education surrounding housing, sports, programming, retention, and success. After years of speaking, writing, and organizing around black trans survival, they shifted entirely to the development of trans-led organizations. August acknowledged the anti-Blackness and trans antagonism that rest in philanthropic institutions, wow, and post-secondary institutions and committed to a culture of storytelling as praxis to redistribute resources to Black trans community. August, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to hearing from you. Our third panelist is Deborah Dunn, PAC MBA, is a family practice physician assistant and the trans health coordinator of the LGBT Resource Center for Chase Brexton Healthcare. Uh, in addition to graduating from Howard University's physician assistant programs in 1983, she holds an MBA from Johns Hopkins University 
In her position at Chase Brexton, she provides leadership and coordination of care for transgender identified patients, establishes best practices for medical transgender care, trains other uh, medical providers, provide consultation to external organizations on transgender related issues, including employee transition, engages in advocacy at the state level and identify research and funding opportunities related to transgender care. She was also a part of the team that wrote Gender, Jer Joy, Journey of Youth, a multidisciplinary program written for transgender diverse youth, adolescents and families, which since its launch has 1800 patients. She has spoken at several national conferences and involved with several other organizations in the nation who writes guidelines uh, for the treatment of transgender, transgender children and adults. She was awarded Physician Assistant of the Year, go ahead, Deborah, by Maryland Academy of Physicians in 2018, Physician, Physician Assistant of the Year by Daily Record in 2021. So that's, that's pretty recent. <laughs> and Healthcare Hero awarded by the National Association of Clinic Healthcare 2018. She serves on the Maryland Board of Physicians, the Physician Assistant Advisory, and the American Academy of Physician Assistants. So Deborah, or I'd rather say Ms. Dunn, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to meet you. And certainly last but not least is Bakari Jones, who is a Baltimore-based creative space maker and LGBTQ advocate with experiences across the technology, healthcare, food, entertainment, nonprofit, and beauty sectors, leveraging, let me tell you something, she, ain't, she don't play around with the booty sector. She, she, she fresh to death. She's sharp. <laughs> Bakari seeks to help, uh, but she leverages her business and Black studies background to help fill the gaps in community programming by producing unique spaces for marginalized, under, and misrepresented demographics. Um, Bakari creates opportunities for equitable, cultural, economic, and intellectual exchanges via in-person, online, and hybrid events. The spaces that she organizes brings together underrepresented, under, under, underrepresented and often marginalized communities with intersectional and overlapping identities. Since 2011, Bakari has organized dynamic spaces including Boys of Baltimore, a safe space for masculine, queen, queer women and trans men Wine and lesbian and lesbian friends, a safe space for LGBTQ women, and most recently, her sweet release, an event series for Black who love Black women. All right, so Bakari, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure, and I had the opportunity to meet Bakari back in 2012 when we were uh, founding the group, the Black Youth Project 100, BYP 100. In back in Chicago, just around the uh, killing of Trayvon Martin, and we gathered together as a result of that of that momentum from that killing, and we were there together when that uh, fateful decision was read about George Zimmerman. When we were 100 deep in Chicago, and so since then, um, Bakari has shown that she has been serious about this work. So. I want to welcome all of our wonderful panelists to thank you so much for joining us for this dialogue. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please give yourselves a warm round of applause and take yourselves off of mute too, because I don't want to miss a word of anything that's being said here tonight. Um, so, Kleiss, I'd like to start with you. Uh, tell us more about, let's start with this uh, conversation around e equity, um, equality rather, especially within the LGBTQIA plus community. I mean, we just celebrated Pride this month, but it seems like every year that Pride comes up, there's always something pivotal, a pivotal policy. There's a new struggle that's happening. But one of the big things that I'm, that I'm hearing about is, um, unfortunately, the level of violence against members of the community, of the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, is continuing to rise. So talk to us about the peace work that you're doing um, and, and what ways is it important that not only should we push for policy, 
but we should also push for peace, especially for people of color within the community. What a blessing it is to be with all of you. And it is a particular joy to be in a space that values knowledge gained through libraries. I am delighted to share with you what might perhaps be a shift in thinking about all that we value in the depth of our personhood as people of diverse and inclusive gender, sexuality, race, and all of the markers and indicators of what's truly good about ourselves. We have passed through what many have called a pandemic brought on by a disease and virus called COVID-19. But in fact, we have lived and continually tried to survive through a syndemic. Syndemics, as opposed to pandemics, are constellated life and experiences of embedded and entangled injustice and inequities that dehumanize us in a almost viciously colonized fashion on levels of both gender and sexuality, as well as race, income, housing, and health. In the face of a syndemic, constellated, embedded, ongoing, and rising to radical trauma, we rise with a salutogenic approach. A salutogenic approach for health navigators like myself, who work within multiply marginalized communities, leads with the positive and views what we do as an integrative approach to uplifting the well within our being, the best of who we are, our well being. That takes an approach that is not just integrative, but that is consciously healing centered in the most radical fashion possible. From the way we articulate in our language as we deal with people of difference to the way in which we create policies that guide and structure our well being, to the way in which we enter into and hopefully are included and accepted into our institutions. All of this must come together to work in pluralistic ways that don't just think of an LGBTQ, et cetera, community or a black community, but that we think of these as communities. And we think of ourselves as not just intersecting, but as impacting, moving towards the clearest possible outcomes for our change. My main outcome has been to work with individuals in an integrated health approach to make sure that they remain whole because no one who is afforded the blessings of our life is broken just because of the challenges that are brought on by the systems that demean us. I want to say deep within myself that the most remarkably beautiful thing is to be in touch with someone who is self-actualized, who you know that they have been accepted for who they are. I'm tired of an ethic of equity and equality that only looks at discrete identities mm. instead of the relational work that we must do together to build coalitions where we are not just fighting for discrete rights or intervening when problems emerge 
or policy shifting to focus only on the bourgeoisie concept of marriage, but that we create a system and systems that integrate our income, distributing all of our wealth well, that provide housing for everybody. And please catch what I'm saying. If you're homeless, just give a house. I am 100% directed to reparative and reparations in the most radical fashion. If there are health disparities, give health, provide health care without any monetization whatsoever. If there are problems of racism, move to a place where every facet of our well being culturally and racially is accepted without pause and without difference. Not only that, but the peace that we indoctrinate within ourselves and that I work for every day in partnership with communities like the McKim Center, the peace that we achieve is linked to our ability to be safe, housed, to have non-monetized and outstanding health care, as well as to be economically whole beyond a discussion, which is quite jejun and insulting of a minimum wage that is $15. And we all know that it should be at least $35. I wanna live in a world where everyone is able to enjoy similar luxuries that promote not just our everyday being, but our well-being in the most mm -hmm. radical fashion possible. And that's what true peace truly is, because peace is not just the cessation of violence. It's also peace of mind and being so whole that you can take a day off, mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. be with your family like the most wealthiest of bourgeois people do without having to grind every day. That is, of course, paired with anger management, impulse control, calm focus and awareness in the present moment that I have also been dedicated to in my peace work. Thank you so much for allowing me to introduce and to speak first. Blessings to you. Thank you, Kleiss. We, we appreciate that. And you gave us a lot to, for us to have this conversation, to start this conversation, I, and I'm, I'm grateful to you for doing that because um, I think Bakari, it's important that, and this is something I'm just kind of taking notes from what Clay said, you know, have an integrated health approach and Deborah, I'm coming to you with that one, so don't go anywhere. But Bakari, the, the self-actualization part, mm -hmm. the part about one's blackness, uh, we're still finding that within the LGBTQIA plus community that this is as much as folks are coming into actualizing who they are, their preferences, the life that they want to live and all of those things. But the self-actualization part is still a challenge for people of color within the community. Talk to us a little bit about how does one make that actualization less painful? Because there are already some forces in the world where people are going to tell folks within the community that you can't be this, you can't do that. We all we all experience that, whether you're a part of the community or not. Mm -hmm. But that that I think that you know, give us some insight into that struggle. But most importantly, to starting the process of actualizing oneself in a peaceful way and not in a destructive way. Um, I think, Kleis, everything that um, you just spoke to, I think, has a direct impact on. Um, on our road and our respective paths to self-actualization. Um, I'm always reminded of what's called uh, Maslow's hierarchy, um, where he refers to, you know, it's like a pyramid. Um, and at the bottom of that pyramid are your basic, the basic fundamentals that we all need, right? So you have shelter and food and safety. Those are all just like the, the barest of minimums that we all need as human beings to survive before we can really get to the point, I think, Faraji, what you're talking about um, is that level of self-actualization and thriving. So before we can get to that point of thriving, we have to be, we have to get to and sustain our survival mode, if you will, 
before we can kind of transcend and then get to a level of self-actualization. So for a lot of, especially black and brown folks that identify um, wherever they identify along the LGBT, LGBTQIA uh, spectrum, uh, those access to those things becomes harder and harder. So it becomes, and, and specifically, um, we kind of, we experience, I think, things in a couple different ways. Um, when folks can physically see your gender variance, um, or they are in a position where they can essentially assume uh, your sexual orientation, um, then that's that gives them the, uh, the ability to kind of manipulate the power that they have um, to kind of tamper and jeopardize the basic fundamentals that you need in terms of your housing and your job and um, all of those things that you need as those basic fundamentals. So I think that, you know, it feels in some way so elementary um, for any of us, especially as black and brown folks to be advocating for the like our basic human rights. But if we don't get those things covered, then our paths to self-actualization, I don't think they, they, I would never say that they become impossible, but they become those uh, like American stories that we hear like, oh, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Mm. And it's, yes, that's still a possibility, but we know as folks that have, you know, generationally have lived in this country, we know it's not an impossibility, but we know there are a lot of circumstances that have to happen for that to happen for someone, right? So it's, it's almost like, you know, winning the lottery ticket as opposed to like, oh, you can just wake up and suddenly get to this level of self-actualization. Well, if you don't have shelter, if you don't have a stable job, you know, um, and that's that's before we even get into, um, I think one of the things that Kleist mentioned also is that sense of belonging, right? The sense of belonging when you're constantly othered and um, made to feel less than and isolated, especially for folks in the LGBTQIA community, um, those things become harder and harder and harder um, because of the impacts of our mental health, right? We're social creatures. Um, and that's regardless of your gender, or regardless of your orientation, we're social creatures. We, uh, we fit together, right? We need that sense of belonging. And without that, it's really difficult for us to thrive. So that's what I'll say. I think in terms of the self-actualization piece, until we get those baseline uh, needs stabilized, it really becomes, again, not impossible, but a much a much more challenging feat for us to get there. So, Bakari, one of the things that you bring up that I think speaks to, and I want to certainly bring August and Deborah. I'm, I'm coming right to you next. But one of the big things that I'm that I'm hearing from you is that even in a in a in a world where there's more conversation, I think, and and I can be totally wrong. So please, for, you know, forgive me of my ignorance. But it seems like there is more conversation about LGBTQIA communities, the welfare of the community, the people in the community, the struggles of the community, the triumphs of the community. It seems like there's more conversation about the community today than we said, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. But it's still, why does it seem to be harder now uh, for, for folks to get to a space where they can actualize why it can considering we see this we see representation of the in the community in many different spaces now we see representation and we see um more i think public dialogues um but we know that like private dialogues will always happen in within our communities right we there's no way that ultimately we could get to this level um a level of hatred if if conversations were not happening about LGBTQIA folks, right? So positive or negative conversations have been happening. I think for Raji, to your point, yes, we have had um, some some shifts in attitudes um, and a higher level of um, a higher level of acceptance on some level. But um, and I know folks kind of get a little touchy when we compare LGBTQ struggles to civil rights era struggles. But I like to draw the comparison to um, what our generationally, right? Like our elders experienced um, during the civil rights movement in terms of integration, right? So we are seeing a lot of instances where it's like, we, we, we are now like the byproducts of, uh, of integration. And we see the ways that, that um, I don't know the, the politically correct way to say that a lot of ways that kind of water down um, a lot of black owned businesses, right? In the civil rights era. In a lot of ways, we kind of see uh, some of that same uh, 
that same watering down happening within the LGBTQIA community because um, that it's like, oh, well, there's a level of acceptance, right? So this is one that back to self-actualization from a business standpoint, right? There's a higher level of acceptance. So a gay bar or a gay club is not necessarily needed. We're all accepted. So we can go to any bar, any pub, any establishment and go and, and mix and mingle. And we're not necessarily going to be threatened or we're not gonna have that same level of community. We're not gonna have that same level of belonging. We're not ultimately gonna achieve the same level of self-actualization. So I think that although the conversations are happening, um, again, back to Kleist's point, that level of community and the actual establishing of peace and camaraderie and actually, I think it boils down to a certain level of understanding is not necessarily happening. Just because we're talking more does not necessarily mean that we are understanding each other more, if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. That means that means it, it sounds like to me and 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 Bakari, it sounds like if we're talking more, but we're not really listening, um, then then that means that we somebody has to shut up. <laughs> somebody has to no, I'm just saying, you know, somebody has to shut up and and get out of their bag, right? And have a discussion. In an understanding with with understanding, oh, okay. Let me let me hear this person out. Mm -hmm. And Deborah, this is what I think. Um, and then we're going to get to you, August. Uh, but Deborah, I think this is this is where I think we are right now, especially when it comes to the trans community. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we're talking about Black trans lives matter. We, mm -hmm. I remember when they were painting that on Charles Street. I mean, driving, I was coming from an event and I happened just to see some pain. I was like, well, what is this? And the next thing you know, I hop out the car and I was like, oh man, I got to go on social media. I got to go on live. You know what I mean? Because this is a major, major moment, especially in that part of the city. And so, you know, when we're having these conversations, the conversations about um, the trans community becomes and, and, and I love how Bakari kind of described it, you know, constantly being othered. Mm -hmm. The trans community is other. Yep. You know what I mean? The trans mm -hmm. community, it seems like that. And I'm, mm -hmm. of course, I'm just looking from the outside in. But talk to us a little bit about first the struggle of the trans community. And August, I'm going to get your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. And what are you seeing in your work with Chase Brexton? Yeah, I see um, a lot of health disparities that haven't changed over the last 12 to 13 years. The, st the statistics remain the same. There's no effort um, to try to change those st statistics. Um, a lot of our patients are really successful, very resilient, educated, hardworking, great, great credit. But, you know, and, and they're getting great um their medical transitions are what they're expecting. Everybody's aligning with the way they feel on the inside, but what we really can't protect them against is those social determinants of health. It's that discrimination, it's a, a rejection. There's still not laws to protect the um, health of people who are identified as trans and non-binary. There are hospitals that still aren't accommodating transgender and non-binary people. You may still have to share a room with someone of the opposite gender. The treatment centers will tell you out front, we don't accommodate transgender people. Um, we still see a lot of uh, rejection and discrimination in housing. So therefore there's a lot of homelessness. There are shelters aren't accommodating. Um, there's um, high poverty, even though people have education and degrees because there are this a group of people who just won't hire transgender people. If they, mm. they look at you and they perceive that you could be trans, no, I don't, we don't want them to work for us. You know, we may have to deal with um, gender harassment. We may have to come up with um, guidelines and that will, that, and we may get lawsuits, things like that. Or we may not just understand. I'm still seeing doctors who are saying, um, you know, I'll take care of your blood pressure, but I'm not going to do that trans thing. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't understand why a doctor would become or anybody in a medical profession would not want to to be to to have a patient have wholeness and completeness. Every patient, like how could you not? You know, sometimes I say to them when I'm teaching them, and they're like, "I'll send them to you." I know, but 
Like you should be embracing all of your patients. Sometimes I ask, so do you not see black people? I mean, like if you're able to pick and choose who you're going to see, then that means that you're not treating all patients fairly in a hundred percent. You know, I just, I, I see these little microaggressions, the bullying, the rejection from families to still go on. I see how it impacts the health of people. You know, I see that. What's a, um, De 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 yeah. talk to us. What is, and for those who may not mm -hmm. know, when you say you see the impact of the health mm -hmm. of people, I mean, first, what are the microaggressions right. that people need right. to know? And then mm -hmm. what are the impacts? Yeah, the microaggressions are these, you know, these that kind of hate that discrimination that says you got to work at this workplace, but you know your name is Mike, but I'm going to use your legal name, so you're going to wear Judy, or I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to have, you know, there's poor access to care, or in the hospital, or um, in, when people are incarcerated, you're going to have to be with people of opposite gender. We may not prescribe your hormones. Families are still rejecting. There's still a lot of violence. I lost maybe three or four patients and since Thanksgiving from just violence. Like one was shot in the head, one was um, stabbed. I'm seeing a lot of my patients, you know, some of them are dying from drug overdoses, from fentanyl laced marijuana. Um, and these, these microaggressions, what I'm talking about is that same thing you feel when you're scared to death. It's like a fight or flight that someone's chasing you for night, or you barely miss an accident. You know how your heart's racing, your blood pressure goes up, your pulse goes up, your blood sugar goes up, you become very anxious. You know, we know that a lot of people in the LGBT community walk around 24 7 with that fight or flight, waiting for the shoe to drop, just pulse racing, just, and these lead to anxiousness and depression and suicidal ideations and substance use and chronic pain. You know, people don't realize what degree stress takes on a person's body. And so what I'll say is, you know, we can help you, but we can't protect you against these rejections and these discriminations. we got to come up with laws to protect the human rights for these yeah, are, patients, are, are we finding for these people, that period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are, are we finding that these threats to to the to the trans community, to the LGBTQIA mm -hmm. community in general, in the public policy arena, are, are we are they getting better now that we have a new federal administration? No, I mean, well, it was really bad, but we're still seeing, for example, um, one state and pretty soon it's going to be 16 states where it's against the law to medically transition transgender children, gender mind, gender mind, non, gender non-binary children. And what I know the impact of that is, is you're going to see a lot of harm done to these kids. Because we know from our Gender Joy program at Chase Braxton, from the starting, from the earlier we start with the medical transition, we start with puberty blockers, the better, the more successful, the quality of life. We see success. We see improvement in depression, anxiety, and substance use. Um, and we see, we're beginning to see people, these kids graduating, going to college, being very successful. And what I'm afraid is going to happen is the opposite. If these kids are not going to be able to be medically transitioned, it's going to be devastating. It really is. Um, what, what, go ahead. No, I was just want to ask, what do you say to, to, to folks that are listening to you tonight and to mm -hmm. listening to this conversation? They might be saying, well, why are we starting with children? You know, children uh -huh. mean they, you know, like when children, uh, they, they, they must one day my son might want to be Spider Man, the next day he wants to be Superman. You know uh -huh. what I mean? When it comes to such a major choice, like who you want to be, um, uh -huh. the, and, and that level of, I mean, it seems like it's a big, it's a lot of pressure just to uh -huh. grow up. So, so what do you say to those parents and community members who uh -huh. are saying, but sh should we even be having these conversations to children? Should yes, children be exposed, uh -huh. be even exposed to, to these discussions without having a proper context, without understanding um, the, the, the joys and the consequences of mm -hmm. the situation? M Mr. Farachi, uh -huh. if I may interject <laughs> very briefly to say sure. that I, after, after Deb speaks, I would like to address that question directly sure. as a uh -huh. black woman of trans experience who came out at the age of three. 
All right. Okay. So yes, back Yes, ma'am. Right. And I, and I, I want to make sure that I want to get mm -hmm. August in because I know mm -hmm. um, they can, can they can they can really speak to that as well. Mm -hmm. So so Deborah, then August, right. and, then Clice. Absolutely, the kids absolutely know their gender from like three years old from birth. Um, they you know, and they, they it's persistent and insistent. I am, I am a girl. I am a boy. I am, I am. Not I want to be. Not I want to wear girl clothes. Not I want to play with girl toys. Not I want to wear pink. I am, you know. And so we know that I, you know, from me being face to face for so many years in an emotional, um, intimate relationship with my patients, I know that their gender identity is something that aligns very deeply with them from birth. So it's not kids trying to be or being confused or am I going to grow up to be a tomboy or, you know, it's not a boy being trying to be a girl or a girl trying to be a boy or being in, stuck in the wrong bodies or anything like that. These are people who truly live authentic lives. They walk the truth of their identities just like anybody else does. And no one else is, really has to account for or justify their gender more than transgender or gender non-binary people do. And I, I would love for that to stop. But Yeah, I, I, would, I, I know the conversation is really, really big. And I think, August, to bring you in, uh, the conversation is not big, just big. It just seems to be all over the place. Um, it seems to, to, to really not, like I hear more people who are not a part of the trans community speaking about this issue than I do about folks who are a part of the trans community. So what's your take on that, um, August? Yeah, um, specifically just on folks who are talking about it, I want to name that um, being trans, I think speaking earlier around uh, has anything changed than uh, us being the trending topic, I guess I'm thinking about hypervisibility um, being misconstrued as safety uh, is just the, the first point. Um, and then two, a lot of misinformation being spread around um, how folks arrive at their gender um, or depart from gender, in my case, um, what transitions look like, um, because no transition is the same, mm -hmm. um, an emphasis on the medical industry um, as just the answer, um, instead of just thinking around how violent um, and coercive gender expectations, gender roles, all of those things can be on everyone. Um, and how like, not to get too like radical, but like how we're all operating under under a system that that forces us to to um, move in violent ways and, and be harm doers and all of those things. So I'm just, I'm, a, I'm very curious about um, I guess the intentions behind folks talking about trans people, um, because I think it is a, a, a form of policing that I think a lot of us need to unlearn. Um, I, I like identify, I guess, as a, a student of abolition. And I think the, the biggest part about that is um, leaning away from how we're policing each other. Like we talk about leaning on, I mean, leaning away from relying on police, but how are we policing how other black folks show up, black queer folks, black queer and trans folks are showing up in those spaces um as a really good start and I know that that's not like the solution immediately like we have to talk about the state and the <laughs> state violence no 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 I, I'm, I'm so happy that you brought it up because I think that that's you know we we're in a social media hyper you know I, I think that our level of inclusion has actually diminished over the years as a result of a lot of different things but I think the way that you're stating it of uh, policing other people. And when we're talking about somebody is always, you know, I, I was reading something where they said the best business that you can do is minding your own. You know what I mean? And, and I think part of that, is, is there's some truth to that, right? But I also understand that we're a part of community. And so because we're a part of a community, there is a responsibility that each of us carry where we are responsible for one another's well-being and, and, and one another's um, um, health in, in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. What is the responsibility? What would you say, uh, August, is one of the, the big asks from the trans community for communities that, for, for folks that are not in the trans community and they're not a part of the LGBTQIA community? What would be the big 
what would the, what, what should our responsibility be in relation to each other? Um, I really hate that this is my first <laughs> first thought, but like stop Uh-oh. killing us. Um, stop killing us. Okay. Yeah, like I I think the most the biggest, and I, I don't speak for all of community, right? Like I I'm black, trans, masculine, um, all of the things, but what something that has really been a a focal point in the movement has centered our death. And I, I wanna I wanna uplift that and also think a little past that. Like who who are we outside of, of black trans death? Um, and challenging folks to reimagine um, what being in community with black trans people look mm-hmm. like, what resourcing black trans people look like, housing black trans people look like, ensuring that we have um, I don't want to say the same resources because like Black folks in general are not resourced, right? I want us all to have the things that we need to survive and thrive. Um, But what that requires is um, one, for us to stop dying um, at the the hands of interpersonal violence. Um, Like we can talk about physical death, also social death, like so much isolation is happening um, within our own communities. Again, just going back to that policing thing, like folks are more worried about our bodies um which is just, it's just so weird to me it's, yeah. it's really weird but like are so worried about our bodies and and surgeries and how we came to be and not in a in an with an intention to get to know us or get to to, to actually be in community with us um but because of the i guess what some folks are phrase, phrasing it is like a lack of understanding or trying to understand Mm-hmm. Um, but you, I mean, you wouldn't go up to a stranger and ask them about their body, right? So I'm just thinking through, like, mm. how how are we mm. how are we moving in community with each other? How can we intentionally engage folks who are not like us and ensure that we're protecting them and resourcing them? I think that's a, a great place to start. Like a lot of us perform and engage in mutual aid to begin with, um, and if we can just really bring the margins to center and really talk about who in our community is, is, is the most impacted um, and make sure that we, we have the things that we need. Um, we, we might not have to turn towards the state to, to get funding for programs and services. Um, yeah. So, so here, here's my aha moment, then Kleiss, I'm gonna go to you, ma'am. Uh, but I think Bakari can appreciate this is you just gave me an aha moment right now, August, because as you talked about um, the body of a trans person, that is the struggle of women, how folks, how society believes that that women don't have agency, or those who identify as a woman don't have agency with their bodies. And certainly, Now I get that part of it, Bakari, Black people, because we don't have agency over our own bodies. So now I I might be drawing a, a, you know, I don't know if I'm off in that connection or that, but that's just the first thing that came to my mind. It's like, oh, we don't have agency over our own bodies over the, and and, you know, whether you're talking about because of state-sponsored violence or simply just because of the, the impact of the transatlantic slave trade or whatever, women don't have it. So therefore, this community continues to suffer from it. Kleist, I want to bring you into this conversation. Now, before we bring here from Kleist, uh, folks, I want to encourage you to make sure you post your questions, your comments to our wonderful panelists tonight, because in a few moments, I'm going to jump to uh, hearing what you have to say. I just wanted to kind of get the conversation started. But as you can see, there's so much that we can cover and we certainly would love to hear from you. So just at the bottom of your screen, just go to the Q&A, post your question. Look, I'm gonna just let you know, if you're disrespectful in your question, it will not be asked. That's all, that's what we wanna say. But Kleist, I wanna wanna bring you back into this, ma'am. Um, in regards to that level of agency and just in, in regards to that piece around about children being able to come to that place and in, in, in based upon your experience. Faraji, we, you, all of us have a lot of work to do in terms of uplifting a response and articulation that does not replicate trauma 
harm, and oppression. The question that you asked was the problem, as well as the problem itself. Mm -hmm. We must never ask questions of people like me that you would never ask of another person. That is an obscenity. And you should retune and we should all retune our minds and hearts to never think in that terms. If you would never say to a cisgender child, ask a question as a media specialist, what in the world are these cisgender children doing? Why are they doing it this early? If you would never, it would be preposterous to ask such a question. Then you should check yourself on the deep level of anti-oppression from this moment forward in our literacy work, in our multimedia literacy work, and never ask such a question. Secondarily, you and many of us, it is jejun, meaning it's an everyday practice to refer to our communities as community in monolithic terms. We must be pluralistic and integrated. There are LGBTQ trans black communities. That gives us the presence of mind to allow for entanglements and conflicts that then can be with work transformed. Mm -hmm. It's not only about killing us, because I'm gonna tell you something. I have been killed before. There's something called spirit murder. I have witnessed with my eyes, not just as a nurse, 72 murders. The murders were not just physical. They were also of mental health. I want a salutogenic world where affirmation is the ground zero and the destination that we are all going to. It's going to require a radical sense of work so that the way in which I am approached, the way in which I am questioned, the way in which we are articulating what has to be articulated in terms of justice is fine and acute and well thought. Pause before speaking because there is an institutional violence that comes with a badly phrased question that mimics the oppression that is forced upon us. And we have an obligation as change makers to, to watch we say with a vigilance, especially with our children, because to speak to children out of turn is to lace within them the disaffirmation that makes mental health so challenging. So what then is affirmation? Because I'm not just talking about buzzwords. We, in my practice, in the Consortium for Youth and Families and 30 years of finely tuned engagement work have identified at least 20 ways that we speak to individuals with affirmation. And Julie, I'd be so glad grateful. If in the Q&A, you would drop the link that I'm going to be referring to right now. We have studied in an evidence-based way, the way that incredible psychologists like Claude Steele helps us by studying the responses of children to gain a perspective of just how affirming language helps us. So, what are those 25 affirmations? The first is to acknowledge, acknowledge and admit the truth with kindness of the injustice that is inculcated in our statements and questions. Accept, advise, approve, approve an application for funding for darn sake, instead of always creating onerous terms. Mm -hmm. Clarify. Make a clarification, yeah. consent, console, encourage, help, give, inspire, uh -huh. listen, motivate, offer, and offer before it asks, reassure, receive, soothe, support, praise, protect, 
thank, validate, value, welcome. These are just some of the everyday processes that we put into motion so that affirmation and how we engage with people is ground zero. And last but not least, I'm not hyper visible. I have been invisibilized all my life, despite the high level on which I'm working. I have laid a, led a life of not being seen, not being on the scene, and not being in a scene. <laughs> and yet we do the work. I am the first person that many of the thousands of children that I've worked with comes to and I say, before we do anything else, just give me your hand, darling. Just look into my eyes. I'm here for you. I'm the first teacher that instead of saying, I need you to do this, I need you to do that, when they're behaviorally maladjusted, I say, I see you there. Mm. I care about you. I support you. Power, when I say power, you say up. Power, up. Power, up. Bring it back. Bring it back. These restorative and healing approaches, just in what we say and how we question and how we make statements, require a radical change in how we relate with people. This is what I do every day of my life, offering these kinds of advisements for how we build as health navigation. Let me tell you something. When I work with mentally neurodivergent people, they are given an individualized plan and it's a beautiful thing where they are asked to, hey, these are the things that this person needs in order to treat them well. Everybody on earth needs to have an individualized plan, honey. Everybody. Everybody needs to have an individualized plan that everybody carries around so that we all are treated in a trauma responsive and healing way. I want everyone to know that I have dreams and they attend to it and not to talk to me like I'm jive. I'm the kind of person that when I get onto the bus and I'm poor, I may run a nonprofit, but I don't make a lot of money. When I get onto the bus, I say, hello, everybody. And blessings to you before I sit down with my cane. So I say that to you and everyone. We must mind our words, mind our questions, mind our statements. And that's how we ground zero affirmation to truly actualize peace. And more importantly, love with one another. Mm. Kleiss, I appreciate that. Thank you so yeah. much. I, I truly, truly appreciate that. And um, I hope my, my hope is, is that as we have this conversation, that we gain an understanding that we communicate with the right tone, uh, certainly with the right energy and spirit. So that way we don't commit any more trauma on anyone with words that may trigger and certainly with um, right. any type of rhetoric uh, that may offend anybody. So, you know, I, I truly appreciate you for, for saying that, Clyce. I want to um, take a couple of questions from our, our audience and folks, you can join us again, post your questions in the Q&A portion of the, um, of the discussion here. Let's start with one anonymous attendee. They asked the question, could any of the panelists speak on the asexual or uh, aromantic communities as I feel they are often not represented widely or well in the queer community? What can we do to support them specifically and highlight their unique needs? Great question. Thank you so much. Can anyone speak to that? Uh, Deborah, I see you kind of shaking your head. Bakari. Am I muted? <clears throat> yeah, I am. Um, when I talk to my patients, um, I don't necessarily ask them about sexual orientation because it doesn't give me a broader or clear um, representation of their sexual orientation. So I like to say, you know, who are you um, sexually attracted to? Who was the gender of your partners? And so they may say asexual or aromantic, but it's very different. It, the definition I can't define because it looks and feels very different for everybody. And so I do, I, I do when I teach other medical providers, I do teach about how to ask about the asexual and aromantic per patient. Because a lot of times they believe that those are people who just aren't sexual. They're not sexual. They don't have sex. And that doesn't, it doesn't mean that at all. Mm. 
it has a different meaning for everybody. And so you got to ask everybody what it means to them, but you should be asking people. So, and I mean, and that, then, that goes back to Kleist's point of using words to, 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 to uplift and to mm-hmm. speak directly to where people are, because I was going to ask, well, what does, you know, based upon the work you do, Deborah, how do you define asexual, mm-hmm. aromantic, and, and based upon the work you do, Bakari, you know, does that meaning that Deborah uses, is there's a change in the spaces that you're in? So, Deborah, you're mm-hmm. saying that those, that, you know, it can change based it's, upon the person, mm-hmm. and that it's better to be respectful to ask people mm-hmm. versus to make the assumption. Right. Because, you know, a lot of times if you're a medical profession and you assume that a person's not sexual who say that they're asexual, first of all, you may not be counseling about birth control or um, sexually transmitted infections, HIV, things like that. Um, There are some people who give, but, you know, give and bring you to orgasm, but you're not going to do me, you know, so that's still sexual. Um, You know, so it's it's a I can never begin to define what those words mean because it feels and looks very different to every single person. So, you know, I'm just more interested in who you're sexually attracted to, mm-hmm. not what you what you say your orientation is, because a lot of people say that they're heterosexual that are cis females, but love having sex with guys or, you know, have I mean, have, like have girl on girl sex, but they don't call themselves lesbians. So if I'm, I'm asking you more questions about who you're sexually attracted to or who your gen- the gender of your partners are, mm-hmm. and they say male and female or trans, and, you know, then I have a better, clearer idea of what your sexual orientation is. Deborah, you bring up a, a, a great point. That, like I said, I think it builds well off of what Kleiss has brought up. And Bakari, I want to kind of get your take on this as well as August, as this as this watcher brought this up which is there has been a number of new terms that have evolved or have come out of the LGBTQIA plus community. When we're talking about cisgender, um, I've heard the term pansexuals. We're talking about asexual, aromantic. Um, how, how does a person uh, who is not familiar with the terms become familiar? How do they, and how, do, how should we start to integrate those terms and use them properly and respectfully um, you know, when we're talking about the community here, Bakari? Um, I think as, you know, again, as Price mentioned, it's definitely communities, you know, it's- Communities, you know, right. Several um, different communities. And I think the, the primary thing is, um, I guess I'm in a space now where I'm like really asking myself and others, do you have a relationship with this person or do you have a relationship with these communities that kind of, I don't want to say gives you a right, but that creates the space for you to ask these questions because mm-hmm. otherwise it really just becomes um, it just becomes exhausting, right? You're just asking trans folks, you're asking LGBTQIA folks, whatever the the term is, you're asking fill in the blank folks to do more of the work. And then the other piece is like, just because, you know, we are in a space where, you know, everyone's sort of under the LGBTQIA plus umbrella and it doesn't, you know, people always bring up like the gay agenda. I always say, we're all waiting for the copy of the gay agenda. None of us got like the key terms automatically where we just know like, oh, I just had it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just boom, it, you know, it came into my brain and yeah, now I know these terms. So even within our communities, we're still learning and developing relationships with one another, right? And then again, to Clice's point, like there's still, there's tension. There's folks that think that everyone should be lumped in under the umbrella and they shouldn't be lumped in under the umbrella. So I think the main thing is really developing um, or really kind of stopping and and pausing and asking yourself, do you have relationship um, with that individual or with those, with that community, whatever the, the group is that you're, you know, curious about in a way that, um, holds those folks in, you know, in integrity and actually means them well, because otherwise, again, you're just asking them to do, um, in my opinion, just like free labor, which, you know, again, we talked about this at the beginning of the Mm. conversation, you know, we are, um, in a position where a lot of us are, you know, far, um, less fortunate than folks that are, um, that are not, um, othered in terms of their gender or their orientation. So I think the main thing is really um, 
some of those things is, and it's not that you can't ask, you know, I think um, it's not that you can't ask, but I would, you know, have you used your resources first? Have you Googled, right? Like, have you Googled some of those things? And then have you Googled how to have this conversation, right? Because yeah. a lot of it sometimes, and I think we're all, I think asking questions for me, I think is a beautiful thing because I think it brings out our childlike nature and that desire, like we're coming, it, it's a spark of like that curiosity, right? There's something that we want to know, but there's also this kind of, I think very um, Western notion of like interrogating people, mm. and, you know, wanting to know, um, especially to August's point, kind of like wanting to just sort of be on trend. So it's like, if you're really asking just so that you can be on trend, you probably can just hold that for yourself. You know what I mean? And, and ask <laughs> if doing that, and I'm serious, but like ask yourself if, if having somebody that's in one of these communities, asking them to do that labor, is it really necessary? Is it helpful? And if, you know, if you're not doing, planning on building relationship with those folks in ways that continue to like build bridges, I would say you, you probably don't necessarily, you don't necessarily need to know, you know? So everything is not for everybody. And I think we, we come into a space and think that that's, that's, that has to be something negative, but it doesn't have to be. So. I, I'm so happy that you kind of spoke to that because I feel like that's where we are in a lot of ways. We're talking about trends. We're talking about, you know, what's, what's current right now. And we have unfortunately marginalized people's lives, their struggles, their experiences um, based on one quote unquote, one label. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I guess I want to get your take on the language as well before we move on to our next question. You know, you know, there are these terms that some folks are saying, well, I'm not, you know, some folks are getting lazy, like he's like Bakari said. So they, you know, I don't want to, you so and so to me versus taking the time to truly respect and understand why these terms uh, have, have, have been developed and why these terms are being used. What, what's your take on this? Yeah, I, I'm i just thinking like, <laughs> what you just said about like what you so and so to me, because I hear that very often with folks who um, uh, who know me, who knew me. Um, and again, I'm just using I statements about my own experiences. Um, language is always changing. And I think it's really important that when I'm in community with someone that they uh, see me specifically for who, who I am, how I'm showing up, and all of all, all of those things. So like, I, I guess, thinking around, um, like the importance of language, knowing that language is, is incredibly limiting, especially for, um, for uh, uh, certain folks experiences, um, and just being able to, I think, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief, uh, be able to show up for them means that you are staying curious um, mm -hmm. instead of antagonistic. And um, I think really leaning into someone's experiences, someone's lived experiences, even if they differ from yours. Um, and for me, what that means is doing like, um, I know a lot of folks try to trivialize like pronoun check-ins and everything. I, I, I love a, a ongoing conversation around consent, especially around, uh, around pronouns, around chosen name, around all of those things, because it, it really does say like, like I, I see you, I honor you, um, and who you are, and I think that's really, really important um, when mm. we're uh, trying to be in community with each other. Mm, I love that. I love that. And and I always ask people, you know, and I mean just in any with that are part of any community. Well, how would you like to be addressed? I mean, that's part of my job as a media person. It's like, okay, how would you like for me to address you? Versus, oh, you look like this, so I'm gonna just take, you know, I'm gonna just take. I'm gonna just take take advantage of the moment and call you whatever I see. So I I, I really appreciate you saying that. Uh, another question coming in, and folks, again, you can post your questions in the Q and A portion right at the bottom of your screen. But another watcher says, I have lately been seeing two S added to the LGBTQ acronym for two spirited. Can you speak on more? Can you speak more on what it means to be two spirited? I haven't seen that personally. But that's that's an interesting um, uh, observation. Anyone can speak to that? Yes, I would like to speak. Yes, ma'am. If okay, two spirit, and this is a quite a a generalization. 
And I, I urge the questioner to do their own research to fill in the blanks. Two Spirit is an indigenous transliteration, meaning it is a term that has been interpreted from the indigenous language, which really has nothing to do with this, this horribly oppressive language of English. Two Spirit is a term that has come about since around the 70s in prevalence to describe indigenous individuals who have a multiplicity of gendered experiences beyond the dominant and norm. And by indigenous, I mean those human beings who seeded and came first on the land that we occupy today mm -hmm. and so-called United States of America, and there's nothing united about this country and other places where indigenous people all over the world have been colonized. Thank you. I know, thank you, Kleist, for, for, for making that clarification because I'd never heard that term. So I'm so happy to hear you break that down for us. And our final question as of right now, folks continue to post your comments and your questions. Um, Ms. Pamela checked in, um, Agben Yalu Pamela, she checked in and she said, hello everyone, good to be here today. How can a social worker serve a community, uh, a member better? And I'm assuming she means member of these various communities. How can a social worker serve a member better? Deborah, can I, can I, can mm -hmm. I get your thoughts on that? Yeah, we definitely need people, um, strong mental health, social workers, um, medical providers, dentists, RNs, um, to, you know, to be a part of the multidisciplinary approach in helping people. And in the community, I really um, want to encourage you to do two things. First of all, you know, learn about cultural diversity so that, you know, your offices can learn how to be, you know, uh, address or be opening and affirming because a lot of times that's a problem and you know a, a patient may go there and um, they may be disrespected so that's the first thing second of all i encourage you to unite or partnership with community partners you know there's lots of them out there that really need help with harm reduction programs there's also a lot of government fundings hrsa um, health departments that can help with that and what I mean by that, for example, one of the things I do in the community in harm reduction is, you know, I was being hurt by seeing my patients, you know, your patients dying from fentanyl um, overdoses. So I partner with a group called Safe Haven in Baltimore with the Baltimore City Health Department. And I write a blanket prescription for Narcan. And last year, 2020, 7,200 Narcans were passed out. So I'm hoping that patients are being saved through that. But that's an example of a harm reduction program. But there, the only way you're gonna know how to help is to get that assessment from the person that's walking that truth. So I encourage you strongly to, uh, to join and, and develop partnerships and relationships with the community partners. Um, and Deborah, and I, I wanna get your take on this. Are we doing enough in Baltimore City to bring equity, equality, um, to the LGBTQIA plus communities. Are we, are we, I mean, if you had to give Baltimore City or even the state of Maryland a grade, what would be that grade? Yeah, it would be poor. They came out with this guide called Healthy People, Healthy Baltimore 2020. And it was supposed to address the health disparities of people who, you know, marginalized or of people who they needed, needed to address um, issues like childhood obesity, diabetes, um, drug overdose, opiate overdoses, things like that. Not one time or anywhere in that um, guideline do you see the LGBTQ mentioned at all. And LGBTQI pay, people have probably one of the top three health disparities of all people. Mm. And so it feels like, you know, you're not important. It, you know, if you're, you're not addressing the issues that could be impacting me, 
And because you're not putting me in this guide, then I feel absent then. And, you know, health departments and places not prescribing PrEP and, you know, PrEP is the one of their saying winning the war on HIV. And I don't really think it is. You know, there's still a lot of stigma with HIV and PrEP. A lot of providers still not prescribing PrEP and PEP. There's still a lot of government agencies that aren't offering an all-inclusive health uh, benefits for their LGBTQI um, employees. You know, a lot of the government organizations aren't making their organizations um, affirming or addressing like Department of Child and Welfare, you know, foster care. They're not teaching foster parents how to be parents to LGBTQ people. Mm. You know, I mean, I can, you want me to spend four hours? I can go on forever. <laughs> on this. Like, you know, they're criminalizing things that they shouldn't criminalize. There's exchange work. Everybody does exchange work. I give you something, you give me something back in return. You know, I, you know, I cook you a good dinner and, you know, hook, give you, hook you up and you, I get four tires. You know what I'm saying? You right. know, people who do exchange work definitely should not be locked up in jail. That is so ridiculous. And so we need to work better with the police departments, the mayor's office. I would really, I know COVID took over in 2020, but, you know, we got to start getting back to some of the issues that are really, a, you know, um, a problem in Baltimore. So, so should the concerns and the needs of the LGBTQ community, LBGT, uh, mm -hmm. LGBTQIA plus communities, mm -hmm. um, should they be looked through the same lens as, you know, I know here in Baltimore, Mayor Brandon Scott is looking at public, you know, violence through a public health issue, mm -hmm. you know, through the lens of public health. Should we look at the, the concerns of these communities through those same lens? Like, That's oh, it's fair. a public health concern. Absolutely. Because there we're, you know, we're saying a rise in HIV and that my gender joy group of people between 18 and 24, you know, we, we got to address that because it's rapidly becoming a problem. And we, you know, so a group of us at Chase Braxton were instrumental in getting um, PrEP um, prescribed for adolescents without a parental consent. But what does that look like? We need the health departments to help us do it because how do you get an adolescent to come to a doctor's office every three months to get blood work every three months to pay for the prep and the HIV meds without it showing up on their parents' insurances? So, you know, we got to come up with programs like that to, you know, address these really serious issues that are cropping up in Baltimore. That's the problem. The problem oh, yes, really is this one of the added problems of trying to do any kind of anti-violence work from a public health perspective is when we do not take the time in a very well-funded way to perform community participatory research and engagement with the communities before we ever even try to do public health. Mm -hmm. The problem with institutions that are the most oppressive, despite their good work, is that they often miss taking the time to have deep community counseling and participatory engagement to find out what the community needs. I've undertaken, for example, in my modest work, to work with the communities like the McKim community in East Baltimore, to work with the mothers, some of whom are LGBTQ, mm. and to ask them ethnographic and autoethnographic questions to see what their experiences of violence are. The problem with the public health approach that is often romanticized here in Baltimore and elsewhere is that it often begins with the thesis that the people themselves are dangerous and that the real violence is the violence that they are committing. But I start from a salutogenic approach, looking at community members as assets, not deficits, mm. and saying they have the truth that they alone need to be centered, centered enough to be able to articulate with care, not just a one-off survey. Oh my 
God, not just one darn survey, but a year of community counseling and health navigation, which I must say, Chase Brexton and the work that you're doing, Deb, you, you do this work, you know, and everyone in this panel knows what I'm talking about. It is there's a kind of violence that comes with someone coming into you, giving you a, a survey without understanding your resources to be able to fill it out, and then leaving you, and you don't hear from them again. A com community counseling says, I'm a part of your community. I grew up in part at a horrific place called St. Leo's Orphanage in East Baltimore, and then went into several different foster homes. I am the community that I serve. And by the way, earlier in our conversation, you said Faraji or identifies as, I want to counsel you with love and counsel everyone. Abolish such terminology. We are, I am. No cisgender person is, is said, how do you identify? <laughs> A pronoun is not preferred for me. It's my pronoun. I don't prefer it. I have it. I am. And Good that question. is what you see, black, I'm a black woman. And my blackness, I'm black. I came of age in the 60s and 70s where we are, we am, we say it with pride. And yes, I'm, yeah. And so that that I want to tell you about getting into the community and going with the communities and being able to be corrected by community. So they have true agency and actualization to lead the process and be centered. Most of the people, women I've talked to, they don't talk about gun violence for heaven's sake. They talk about intimate partner violence. They talk about the institutional violence of not being able to get their meds. They talk about the violence of being able to be bullied by police. They talk about other forms of violence that are not talked about because white People are afraid in this city and it's hijacked it. It's not to, to poo poo or disvalue what is happening in terms of gun violence, but it's also the kinds of violence that are not being talked about because we haven't engaged on a community level. Mm. Clice, once again, thank you so much. And I appreciate you making that correction uh, to me with love. Thank you so much. Um, Bakari, I want to I want to get your take, and August, I want to get your take. Bakari, in terms of engaging folks at this point, because we I feel like I feel like this panel here, we breaking down the walls, but then the, when we go out into the larger communities of Black people where Black people reside, we're back at kind of I feel like we're kind of at square one in some cases. No, we're so not. I, uh oh, no, we're not. I'm in a black. I do work in a black community every day. After before here, I was with a black community. No, mm -hmm. we're not. See, a lot of people say, "Oh, black, black is tougher for black people. LGBTQ uh, issues no. are tougher for black people." Mm -hmm. I know you're not saying that. No, 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 black people in our communities have to be engaged by the people who are also in the communities who do the health practice and help, help, and help navigation and everything. I agree. So that we say that it might be very tough to, to engage with them. It's, it's, it's tough with all people who have these kinds of prob everyday problems that are the economic injustice, health injustice, housing injustice. These are problems systemically that are very hard. Please, Faraji. Sure, no problem, thank you. And, and, and Bakari, I wanted to kind of get your take on the process of engaging. What Deborah said in terms of looking at the, the issues from a public health standpoint, because it has to go deeper. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we take it to that deep level when you're, when you're dealing with all of these other issues that Kleist brings up, then at the same time, you're like, hey folks, we need to, we need to create more space, uh, uh, not just for members of the LGBTQIA community, but more importantly, we need to engage in a way that's gonna bring about some equality. Hmm. Um, two things. Um, one, I think, I think that that specifically for Black and Brown folks in this country, I do think that we also deal with respectability politics in a way 
that mm. creates an additional barrier. I don't think, at this point, I don't think it's necessarily harder for us to come to these like levels of understanding and like revelation, if you will, and acceptance um, of folks. But I do think that we deal with that respectability um, be out of a place of what we perceive as like safety, right? We, that level of respectability is is trying to come from a place of wanting to protect you. Our loved ones didn't want us to be any different than we already already were as Black folks. Um, but then the other thing I would say is that, um, and I'm still, I, I consider myself like um, a, a novice in terms of um, like actual public policy work. But one of the things I learned when I was in school was like that white public opinion impacts and directs public policy. Um, mm. And so what are the ways, what are the things for people that don't necessarily have access to or don't yet have an entry point into community work that they can do? What are the ways that you can impact, um, and not center, but what are the ways that you can impact um, specifically those that impact public policy? And so if that's white folks that are able to create public policy, what are the ways that you can impact their levels of understanding? Um, that's one thing that I think you can do externally. And then I think internally, it goes back to, again, Clyde's been on point all night, the, the summation of those microaggressions that many of us experience what impact is your microaggression that you don't, might not think that disregarding someone's pronoun or um, disregarding the name that someone um, informs you is the name that they have for themselves? Um, what's the impact of that microaggression and what are the ways that you can kind of stop and check yourself? Um, so it could be something that on one hand, you might not think it has a, it might not have a catastrophic negative event, you know, negative impact, excuse me, but what are the ways that you can kind of kind of take that and shift it to be more positive. And I think something that's as small as asking not just the person that you deem as other what their pronouns are, but but having the space where you say, this is an environment where we're going to ask everyone what their pronouns are, and we're not going to assume anyone's pronoun. Because that's just an experience that I've had personally, both mm -hmm. asking, what's your pronoun? And I'm like, well, you just by you asking me my pronoun, you've now othered me in the space with all these other people, you've isolated me by just asking me what my pronoun is, as opposed to, hey, person one walks in the door, how you doing, nice to meet you, what's your name and pronoun? Person two walks in, hey, how you doing, what's your name, what's your pronoun? Mm. So creating fully inclusive experiences, and I don't think that that necessarily comes from a negative space, um, but it's like taking it the, the step further, right? What's the way that we're all gonna come and share these norms in this small group. So mm. those are the, the some of the, like the small ways that I think we can start to try to, to make impact. Bakari, that's small ways, but it makes a big difference. It does. Small and ways makes a big difference. So. Absolutely. But, uh, I guess as we wrap up tonight's conversation, but I wanted to get your take on this um, as we're talking about, you know, policy, we talk about community, but I want to get your take on public institution because we have a public institution like the library you know, what can the libraries do to support the uh, LGBTQIA plus communities um, in a way that's going to create inclusion, that's going to bring understanding, um, and that's going to really push the needle on, on the issues that are affecting these communities? Faraji, Joan Bryan asked an extremely important question that I would like to say this in response to. Yes, ma'am. Joan Bryan, Ask us, members of the panel, to work in, for several months at least with the Baltimore County Human Relations Commission. Value us by compensating us well for our expertise and services. And let us be in fellowship and communication with you and bona fide partnership coalition building and also professional development. Instead of thinking that a recording can do it, mm -hmm. know that what has been said this evening is but a minuscule piece mm -hmm. of the wisdom that the Baltimore County Human Relations Commission may take for the extremely serious work of fighting violence against LGBTQIA plus people. It will take more time than you think is possible 
because I'm going to tell you, we are not adjunct marginal. We are not the mindful moment. We are not just one training. It requires truly community building for a movement, mm -hmm. a true movement, movement building for it. And that is my answer, John Bryan, with great respect to you. Thank you so much, Clice. Uh, August? Yeah, I think what Clice just said really leans into the answer as well when, we, when we're talking about um, public institutions um, all for a partnership, I guess. But uh, I think for starters, having more than um, one uh, program around uh, race and LGBTQIA um, panels would be a, a great start to like really invest into um, and my a lot of my um, work is or only my work is only around black trans people so I, I do think it's important for me to name that um, uh, that uh, we're investing in community specifically Baltimore safe haven um, I just want to shout out Aya since I'm here, because that's my mama. Um, but yeah, like I think it's, and, and also I'm coming at a place understanding that public libraries are disgustingly underfunded um, and thinking through like how, how the city, how the county, um, I guess budget for and account for what they are investing into. I think you know, the folks who are building out these programs and partnerships and all of that, it's really important to, to make sure that um, you have folks like who are here on the panel to speak to varying experiences, what's missing um, in those programs. Um, and also just thinking about what, what's actually in the library, um, what, who, what authors and um, what conversations are, are we having and highlighting? I will say that like, Baltimore County got some, has some really great programs <laughs> to begin with, but um, I'm really just thinking about how all of these partnerships that we see that are highlighting Black, queer, and trans folks, um, or I'll say that I've, I've seen, um, tend to happen during the month of June. Like, I am booked and busy during the month of June, and that, and then, like, maybe during, like, Trans Awareness Week or Trans Week of Remembrance, and that's that. Um, but we are still here. We are still trying to live and thrive and survive all year round, just like everyone else. And, and I think it's really important to keep having those conversations um, and really letting folks who, who look like us uh, lead them um, is, is, is important, yeah. I, I love it, I love it. Um, I, I wanna pose this final question coming in from Edmund. Who, who I think asks a really great question as we close out because we've been talking about so many different pieces, but he uh, said, as queer trans people of color, we are often the ones taking care of each other. But what are some ways each of you have been caring for yourselves this year so you can remain active and present in supporting our community? I wanna leave that as the big end question. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. How are you taking care of yourselves um, during this, this pandemic and during this new year? And what would you recommend to, to, to other folks within the communities on how they can take care of themselves? I will, Akari? Um, I have been meditating like never before, um, <laughs> which is a huge milestone for me. Um, I'm using this app called Insight Timer. Um, so I feel like I get that little uh, endorphin rush when I see that like I've hit my little meditation milestone for the day. Um, and then something else that's very minor, but it has had a, um, a pretty significant impact um, is that I am unfollowing um, folks on all social media accounts when it's like even an ounce of like anti, um, anti-blackness, anti-queerness, anti like any hateration in the dancery of my social media, I just, I'm, I'm <laughs> removing it immediately because I feel like this yeah. is a space that I choose to cultivate for myself and I'm just eliminating it. It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm not still presently like in community with those folks in the world, in the city, in the state, whatever the case may be, but 
they're not getting access to like my subconscious and my conscious mind. Mm. Um, if there's any type of like just overly negative energy. So those are two things that I've been doing to try to, uh, you know, maintain. Meditation and deletion. <laughs> I understand. Deborah? Yeah, I have really close relationships with my patients and, you know, I spend a lot of time and I feel the pain when they have pain. And, you know, it hurts me very much to lose a patient and, you know, just seeing that struggle and that, you know, people being resilient. And so probably at least once or twice a year, I do go to therapy. Um, you know, uh, I believe that that's one of the best ways that you can um, have wellness for yourself. I'm a bass player, which really takes me to another dimension. <laughs> it's just in a recorded in a music video last week. So oh, awesome. <laughs> so hopefully you all be saying that soon but no it's i think it's important to take care of yourself um, exercise eat well get rest go to therapy you know a lot of people stigmatize therapy but you, um i think it's really important that your mental health is important that you take care of that also yes i, I would agree <laughs> I definitely i would definitely agree august yeah i i struggle um and have always struggled with self-care. Um, I also know Edmund that is part of my community. Hey friend. Um, I would say that being in community with black trans masculine folks have been, has been so transformative for me. Um, the past year really pouring into each other, investing in each other's skill sets and talents and like transforming each other's, uh, I think, I guess, definitions of what it means to, to show up for each other, show up in community, getting each other jobs and resources and, and all of those things have just been bringing me so much joy. Um, like I, I actually don't know another word to explain it. Um, and, and it's like, it's labor, right? But like, I think to just see some of the boys just, just feel seen and feel loved um, has been really, really great. So I, I'm, I'm self-care for me is, is really just making sure that, that the folks who, look like me and or, or or may not look like me um are resourced and and are feeling loved so awesome awesome thank you so much august and last but certainly not least Kleiss. my biological father died of covid and mm -hmm. the obituary left me out of it of all his children my teacher layla africa who I trained with to be a nurse, the author of African Holistic Health died of COVID. My sister died of COVID. 21 other people in my life died of COVID. I feel like I'm in AIDS world all over again. I am not loved enough. I in the absence of, of people around me who are, are dying and the 12 hour days that I work in the field, working in communities where I am openly a black woman of trans experience, but I'm not working on trans or LGBTQIA issues. I'm working on credible messaging for peace issues every day in these communities. And we shifted our program to virtual, but actually to be quite honest, I wasn't just virtual. I was going into the house to the families who have been involved with either a domestic violence shooting or a stabbing or some other kind of violence, even gun violence, and training them how not to talk to the media, for example, you know, which just descend on, descend on them to sensationalize. And all kinds of the things that I do every single day, in addition to our peace education quote, after school and summer school programs. I'm so present for others, but I'm gonna tell you something. I've never had the luxury of people being present for me. People are very, very judgmental, very, very scared to care for me and to interact. People don't call. I'm one of the last people thought of to be invited to participate in projects. This is a tough life that I lead, and it's always been tough, raised up in orphanages and foster care and homelessness, being homeless, staying at Weinberg Center, the homeless shelter, and writing a grant for Weinberg at the same time. I'm going to tell you something. 
this idea of self-care is one of the most, most bourgeois notions on first breath because it assumes that there are people who lead the kind of lives that you can actually have the time to do self-care. I'm sorry, but I'm struggling and I don't always do self-care right. I need someone and people to also care for me because I don't get enough of it and I'm old now and I'm disabled. And I think that we need to be elevating community care. Thank you for listening to my heartfelt response. God bless you all. Thank you for sharing, Christ. And um, I hope tonight can be the start of, you know, you being a part of a community. I really do hope and pray that um, tonight we can have, you know, first, I, the, the, the responses have all been enlightening for me as I'm striving to grow and to understand all people um and i'm really have been humbled and i, I consider it to be an honor and a privilege to be a part of this conversation um and so i'm learning and i'm striving to grow and um you know i'm, I'm listening and i'm taking in everything that was shared tonight and my hope is is that um that i can whatever platform that i'm blessed to be on i can take the spirit and the energy, the insight, the wisdom that each one of you have shared with me tonight to, to others so that way we can, I can serve as a conduit to bridge the gap of understanding and of humanity. So I thank you so much for the time tonight. And I thank all of you for tuning in tonight to being a part of the conversation. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation as much as we did. And most importantly, that you gained something that will raise your consciousness at least one degree to get us into a better understanding about the joys and the struggles of those who are part of the LGBTQIA plus communities. And now, Brenda, thank you so much and back to you. Thank you so much to our esteemed panel for a thoughtful, deep and moving discussion. Thank you for increasing our understanding of what is needed to advance equity inclusion for LGBTQ communities. Thank you to the Baltimore Relations Commission and Baltimore Human um, Relations Council for partnering with the library to make this series possible. And you have made so many valuable moving points tonight. Just some, peace is not the cessation of violence. It is peace of mind. Before we can thrive, we must sustain our basic survival. A sense of belonging is critical for survival. We have had some shifts in attitude, but not sufficient listening or understanding. Phys physicians are rejecting communities and denying their wholeness and completeness. Constant microaggressions impact the health of people. People are more concerned about our bodies and medical transitions than they are about our humanity. Pause before speaking, avoid replicating harm, affirm in 20 ways every day, do your own work, research Google, then Google how to have the conversation. Ask yourself if you have a basis for asking the question, do you need to know? Hold others in integrity, abolish identify as preferred, or not preferred, I am. Let the community lead the process. Ask yourself, how can you impact those who impact public policy? Examine the impact of microaggression, like misusing someone's pronouns. Ask everyone what their pronouns are. Don't other people. We need relationship building, partnering between social service agencies, partnering with the mayor's office. We need programs and community engagement and participatory research with communities. Find out what is needed by asking members of the community. What have been their experiences? Ask ethnographic questions. Community members are assets. Center their voices. Don't just survey them and leave them. Connect with them. What can libraries do? Keep supporting these conversations. And I just want to tell you, Kleist, you are valued, you belong, we esteem you, we love you, we applaud your courage and opening up your heart and saying that you need community 
that you're isolated. We are here for, for you. We stand with you. We will not abandon you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining tonight's discussion. Peace and blessings. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. And now, do I have time to just do a few announcements? Yes, upcoming programs. Please come out and support these valuable programs. Public library uh, staff have worked very hard to make these programs possible. Come out and support Fierce Angels, Living with a Legacy from the Sacred dark feminine to the strong black woman in conversation with Dr. Sherry Parks, Wednesday, July 7th at 7 p.m. Anti-racist story time. Our young uh, librarians have come together to produce these story times for the education of young and old. Please come out Saturday, July 10th at 10 a.m. They have worked hard to, to create a quality program to reverse racism anti-racism racism book discussion, Thursday, July 20th at 7 p.m. On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean V. Young. I hope I'm saying that right. Please come out and support these library programs. Have a wonderful, blessed night. Thank you.